I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today, Karen Hickson and Ashley Heathfield. Karen is the Rural and Small Library Consultant at the Colorado State Library. He's an engaging and enthusiastic public speaker focusing on customer service and policy. Based in Wetmore, Colorado, he has served as the president of the Association for Rural and Small Libraries and has a passion for helping strengthen what you do to meet the needs of your community. He's built his own house, walked across the country, worked with the elderly and dying, learned blacksmithing, and worked in public libraries. Ashley is a senior project manager with the Office of eHealth Innovation. Ashley's work is focused on virtual health and digital health equity projects. She's passionate about leveraging technology to create a more equitable healthcare landscape and working collaboratively with local and state partners to decrease health and access disparities. Ashley has spent most of her career in the public sector and has a history of working across teams and state agencies to maximize efforts and sync shared objectives, particularly when it comes to telehealth and equity in access to digital tools. Ashley holds a Master of Public Health from Colorado State University. Thank you both for being with us today, Ashley and Kieran. I will turn the presentation over to both of you. Great, thank you so much. So bear with me as I'm just going to share the presentation. Great. And so I know that Dana just gave us lovely bios <laughs> and read those to you, but we thought we would um, introduce our, each other uh, to kick things off. And so again, here's Kieran, um, the Rural and Small Library Consultant for the Colorado State Library. Um, it has been such a pleasure to work with Kieran in this project. Uh, his passion and advocacy for rural communities really comes through. We actually live, I think, about an hour and a half maybe yeah. from each other. Um, yeah. And Kieran is just such a joyful person. And so it is just that that his humor and joy for this work and then passion for these communities really comes together in a really beautiful way for this project. So and actually I was I was contemplating how I would introduce you and realize that every time I, I'm done with a meeting with, with Ashley that I feel uplifted. And like I mean, I'm in a lot of meetings. That's hard to do, right? Like that's a, a, a true skill, and I, and I was I was contemplating like why is that how does how does that happen, and I think it's it's because you're a real clear communicator, and a really smooth project manager, and you're kind of laid back with it, um, and I think that really helps, and you have a get her done kind of attitude, and and that that really just kind of brings it up a level. A colleague of mine, um, when I, I I said you know how how would you describe Ashley in this webinar? And she said, well, she's a biscuit. So I'm going to go with that. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about why we're doing this uh, telehealth project in Colorado libraries. We're going to talk about how we built it. Uh, we're going to talk about how we're measuring our success and the partnerships that we've done, the lessons that we've, we've learned and that we are learning and then talk about a little bit about what's next. So why this project? Um, so I, I, I do live really rurally and uh, I have uh, I had a neighbor and and uh, I had this neighbor for 20 some odd years before he committed suicide and and one of the things I knew about him pretty early on, along with him being just a real cowboy, uh, the handlebar mustache, always wearing his duster, was that he's fairly much illiterate. Um, had a hard time reading and writing, uh, couldn't really leave a note. Um, and when it came to technology and computers, he really didn't want to have anything to do with it. It was like a landline was about as, as much of a phone as he wanted to have. And one of the things that happened in his life was was he was diagnosed with throat cancer and what we found out is like his fear and you know he was a man of a certain age in a certain place and and he didn't like to not know the answers to things and he didn't like to look stupid in front of other people and or to not i don't know to just not know the answer or or not 
I don't know, kind of that that feeling dumb in front of a crowd thing. Um, and he kind of had a fear of, of asking questions. So when I think about the role of libraries, like I don't know that libraries are going to solve healthcare issues, but I think we are really good at literacy. And literacy nowadays really includes digital literacy. And literacy nowadays kind of includes access and like access and the being able to use something I think are some of the really important parts of what I got out of out of my my neighbor's life and and when I thought about uh, I, I was I was told I was going to help make the broadband plan for the Colorado State Library I was like okay you know what is it that rural communities need what is it that a library can do for a rural community and and really leverage our strengths and I think our strengths really are that access and that and that that literacy piece. So digital literacy in this in this part part. So for me, it became really clear that in order to to really help a rural community, and these are communities that are far flung from you know clinics and specialties, doctors and stuff like that, that helping people on a really basic level be digitally literate and have access to the tools that will help them connect with their doctor seem to be the most important thing I could do. So I started to talk to Ashley. We met at a meeting, I think it was. Was that, is that how you remember it, Ashley? Is that a meeting? That's right. And I think it was the broadband roadmap meeting. Ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I admit I didn't know that Colorado had an office of e-health innovation. Yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so that so and just for the rest of the folks, um, I'm, I'm assuming most of you don't know that either. Uh, <laughs> and it actually is not a common office uh, for a state to have. Um, so a little bit about us: uh, we were established in 2015 through an executive order. Uh, responding to the consensus uh, between public and private stakeholders of a need for statewide health IT governance and coordination. Um, so we're housed in the Lieutenant Governor's office, and our team is responsible for defining, maintaining, and evolving Colorado's health IT strategy concerning care coordination, data access, healthcare integration, payment reform, and care delivery. So to ensure these efforts align with the wants and needs of Coloradans um, and healthcare providers, uh, we have a health IT roadmap. And our current roadmap identifies the three goals that you see on uh, the screen here uh, that kind of guides our work as ha or has guided our work for the past, past few years. Um, so that is that Coloradans, community partners, payers, state, local, and tribal agencies all share data and have equitable access to needed health and social information. That Coloradans can access high quality in-person, virtual, and remote health services that are coordinated through information and technology systems and that Colorado improves health equity through inclusive and innovative use of trusted health IT and digital health solutions. So there's a variety of people on our team uh, working on a variety of different health IT things. Um, my work really focuses in on telehealth and in digital inclusion. And so really um, the objective or kind of overarching goal that guides that work is improving equity and telehealth access for Coloradans and then supporting those community providers that are offering in-person services as well to, to offer telehealth services too. Um, and so we're involved with their, I'm involved with the broadband office in a couple of different ways. I actually run a grant um, for them funding healthcare providers in improving their network equipment and uh, purchasing devices to loan out to patients that don't have devices of their own so they can still benefit from telehealth. Um, and through that work, I also um, work with the Department of Labor and Employment and the Broadband Office on creating the digital access plan for the state. So this is a plan that uh, describes the framework and the strategies to make sure that everyone across our state is able to have the tools um, that they need to be connected. I mean, that could be virtual education or telehealth. Um, there are certain aspects just needed for folks to be able to really take advantage of those things, such as, uh, again, device access, um, in-home internet subscriptions, that are affordable, um, a knowledge of how to use these tools. And so it was really um, through that work, again, that I got involved with the Broadband Roadmap, Matt Kieran, um, but also something that's really shaped how I think about 
um, this work. So, you know, the broadband office is getting a ton of federal money to improve internet and broadband infrastructure throughout the state, which is really, really exciting. Um, but that's also several years out. And what kept coming back to me was, well, what can we do to make sure that people are able to benefit from telehealth and, and other virtual services right now um, and not have to really wait for that? Um, and so that, yeah, again, really brought up uh, when Kira and I were in this meeting, it just was two meetings of the mind. You know, I've heard of other states that have, or I know of other states that have a library telehealth program. And so uh, the, it was just the right moment for us to come together and really work on this. And so just before we get too far into the presentation, I also just want to level set on what we mean by telehealth. Again, not that the libraries are providing any telehealth services, right? It's just access um, for someone to be able to connect with their provider. But telehealth is kind of a confusing term. Um, it, there's been a lot of back and forth. Is it telemedicine? Is it telehealth? And really just wanted to level set that when we say telehealth, we just mean a variety of mechanisms uh, that a, a patient can connect with their provider or manage their health where they're not in the same room with their provider and they're using digital tools. So again, that can be uh, audio-visual connection with their healthcare provider, that can be monitoring their blood glucose um, continuously through, through technology or managing their blood pressure and sending that information to their provider to take a look at. So just wanted to provide that at the beginning. And then also give a land, uh, kind of a snapshot of what telehealth utilization looks like in Colorado. And again, like what's really spurring some of, some of this project. Um, so as you can see, and, and as um, is not probably shocking to any of you, telehealth was actually very, legalization was very, very low uh, before the pandemic. Um, and then it skyrocketed. And now we're kind of seeing it, it level off quite a bit. And it's dropped, it's dropped significantly from the height of the pandemic, which is also to be expected as we're not, uh, thankfully, in any stay-at-home orders anymore. Um, but interestingly, Medicaid uh, was the payer that saw the largest increase in telehealth utilization in our state. Um, but we also see some disparities with, with that utilization. Uh, so we see this across age ranges. Uh, older adults tend to or have lower adoption rates than other age groups when it comes to telehealth. And then I'll show you in a couple maps, but rural counties in our state have half the number of telehealth visits compared to their urban counterparts, which um, is, you know, should be a little bit shocking. Telehealth was really supposed to be this mechanism that increased access to care for rural communities specifically, as we know that there's longer distances to specialty care or providers, and um, that's really not what we've seen um, in, in any of this. Um, and, we can, and we also see some of the things that probably contribute to that is, you know, varying levels of preparedness for using technology. Um, if you don't have a web-enabled device outside of your smartphone, um, or you don't have a home internet subscription, you know, that is likely going to lead to an unequal adoption and use of that technology as a whole. Um, and as, you know, as important as internet subscriptions and web-enabled devices are, digital skills and comfort using technology are also really important when we think about adoption of new technologies in general. And so this map, um, Kira and I had worked with the Office of Information Technology to kind of look at almost like a needs assessment, like where, where are things at right now? So we pulled in American Community Survey data and matched that up with data that Kieran had on where libraries are in the state. So when you're looking at this map, the darker purple colors indicate a higher percentage of households that don't have internet access um, or, don't, or report not having internet access at home. Um, so in case those are folks who are not familiar with how Colorado is laid out, you know, a lot of the state is, is actually pretty rural. That, kind of quarter, we see a lot of little dots and the lightest colors. That's what we call our front range. And so that's where you'll find our most densely populated urban areas, such as Denver, um, Boulder, um, Fort Collins. And so as you can see, we have lower access to internet in kind of the southern half of the state, on the eastern half of the state, and in that top uh, northwest corner. And then also looking at um, percentage of households that don't have a device at home. So again, this is actually quite a bit smaller. There's less households that don't have any kind of device. But those households that don't are, again, kind of matching with the internet access on so the lower half of the state, the eastern half of the state, and particularly in that southeast corner. And so here's the map to, to rule them all at this point, is really looking at that telehealth utilization. So this map shows um, the lower, uh, the, the top 20 counties with the lowest telehealth utilization. Um, and then I tried to kind of pull it all together by showing the little stars are indicating 
the counties with the highest percentage of households that lack in access to the internet or devices. And then the little smiley faces are where we've actually funded libraries uh, for this project. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of overlap and you'll, you know, you can see Swatch, um, Morgan, Kit Carson. So, you know, some of these maybe not have the lowest utilization, but they're not far off <laughs> either. Um, so that was kind of the needs assessment we took when kind of looking at uh, what, where we, sh what, how should we build this project, which very nicely brings us into the next section of how we built this. So in addition to the broadband access, the device access, um, we also looked at something called the county health rankings and roadmaps. Um, so if you're not familiar, this is something the University of Wisconsin does for nationally. So you can look at the state like you're seeing on this screen, and then you can drill down to the county. And, and essentially, it's measuring based on a variety of factors, kind of the, the level of health that a county has. And so some of the factors that we took into account are listed on the left hand side of the screen. Um, but again, kind of trying to think through, well, if we were to fund a, a tele, telehealth hub of some sort or better or trying to increase access to telehealth, where would we have the biggest impact? So again, where is there uh, lower access to behavioral health providers, um, lower physical health days? So where, where would a project really make the most impact um, in a community? And we talked about funding. So it, in, in Colorado, libraries that have a legal service area population under a thousand, um, you're looking at at a a, a range of libraries um, with total operating expenditures, you know, between like twelve and and there is one, and it's kind of the outlier that's over a hundred thousand, but the the median is somewhere around twenty seven thousand. And when I look at all of the total operating um, expenditures or budgets for libraries in Colorado, about 9% of them have budgets under $40,000 a year. And so when I think about what I'm asking those libraries to do, I'm also thinking about other barriers to grant funding. And and besides like, oh, we don't have money, there's also like, well, but we don't really have a staff person to help either. We don't have a staff person maybe to pull off the project or to do all the reporting or the the applying or the, or the getting of the grant. Um, and in those libraries uh, in legal service areas under about a thousand folks, full-time equivalency or like a 40-hour work week, the median is less than one, right? And the, the range is actually barely more than one, it's like 1.1. So when I think about that, I think about, you know, how am I going to pull off a project where the person maybe doesn't have time to have a project pulled off in their area, but also needs the equipment and needs the, needs the, the go? And, and when I was talking to Ashley about it, about the funding in particular, we were uh, most of the state grants like this uh, come where it was like, okay, if you spend the money and you send us the receipts, you'll get reimbursed. I was like, okay, in a town where the total operating budget for the whole library, including salaries, is less than forty thousand dollars, and we're talking about, you know, you could get a booth, a privacy booth that's twenty thousand dollars. Like, what are you really asking them to put in front? Like, how are you asking them to front this money? And it's, you know, more than half spend more than half of your annual budget and we'll reimburse you on on government time, which is a bureaucracy and slow and we go as fast as we can, but it's not going to be very quick. Um, you know, the turnaround just isn't possible. So that kind of also helped figure out for, I think for me, for sure, like how, how are we going to build this? We're going to, we're going to make sure that this can be, you know, the money up front which Ashley was able to pull off again because she's a biscuit. Um, <laughs> so that and we looked at uh, other barriers to the grant and asked the libraries, like, what are you seeing in your communities? Are people already coming in and trying to do some sort of telehealth appointment on your public access computer in the middle of the lobby and show some doctor their mole? Like, you know, what's actually happening in the field? Um, and I think that's really kind of helped us decide how we're rolling this out. Um, yeah. So 
the other thing we're looking at is how we're measuring success, right? Um, so how we're going to kind of look at the, if this works. This is our pilot project. It's an amazing partnership with um, the Office of eHealth Innovations and, and the State Library. And how are we going to see if it, if it worked out? So Colorado really does have a strong culture for outcome-based evaluation. And we wanted to focus on what the impact is. It's it's really, for us, it's, it's not a numbers game. Uh, it's just not. I don't want to end up at the end of this project telling a story about you know, 250 or 2,500 or 25,000 people used the blah, blah, blah. Like, that's not the story I want to end up with. I want to tell a story where it's, I'm talking about how access to telehealth at a library helped a family whose, you know, child needed to go to National Jewish, which is only in Denver and is a specialty thing. Um, and instead of having, you know, they did have to go, you know, the first time and maybe a couple times. But after that, they were able to use their library and save that time driving, save the sibling from having to get out of school because they couldn't find child care because the whole family has to go to Denver. And it's a five hour drive. So, you know. They, they have to stay overnight and like I want to solve that problem and I want to tell that story and then I want to tell you how many people besides that family used used the library for for access to telehealth so I think that's kind of where our evaluation is coming from and I think on on the next and and one of the things we said to the libraries was not only are is the equipment that you you'll get for this telehealth available for telehealth. If somebody's not using it for telehealth, it could also be where they're doing their podcast or where they're learning how to do uh, some sort of workforce thing. Like it's it's available all the time. It's available for what the library needs it to be. And it's available for telehealth. So, you know, at one point it was kind of like, this is a giant telehub. But, you know, we started inventing words and it, and it gets messy. So anyway, um, we have a website. Uh, you can you can see the link there. We'll talk more about it later. And you can see kind of the eval that we're, we're putting forward. And we, uh, we're about midway. Um, and the website also has access to uh, all of the flyers and different logos and things like that uh, on it, um, whole media kit for you there. Um, and I think that's kind of how we want to think about uh, what we're doing. And we're just kind of getting started. So we don't have a lot of results. I'd love to be able to share the results of, uh, and impact with you right now. But, you know, catch me next year. Then we'll know. Um, and this kind of leads into to partnerships. So we we didn't know exactly. I certainly didn't know other than the, um, what, you know, we figured out which libraries and what they might need as far as, you know, a, a computer or headset or, you know, do they have a corner? Do they need like a a screen so that you know the whole library doesn't have to see their mole or like what the deal is there um but we didn't really know i didn't really know what kind of medical equipment would be reasonable or 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 needed to have some sort of telehealth appointment and could the library also provide that so we talked with the american heart association and they were like oh yeah blood pressure Blood pressure is something that a doctor would like to check in on. They might have the results for your, from your labs or, and, and be able to talk to you about that. But if it's something they want to monitor, blood pressure and your weight, those are things we can cover. Um, they also talked about uh, oximeters, so pulse ox, a little thing that clips onto your finger and, and tells you how much oxygen is in your blood. Um, that wasn't something they could provide, but it was something that they recommended. Um, we also talked to other uh, larger organizations, that, doctors and hospitals, and they were like, yeah, okay, a thermometer, like a forehead thermometer, so that, you know, the, the temperature, so your temperature, your weight, and I was like, oh, this is kind of like when I go to the doctor, the things they make me do before I sit there awkwardly in the room with the, the funny gown on. So this made sense. It's that they aren't things that um, are used up. As you know, there are things that can be reused, cleaned, and, and reused for other patients. Um, there's a question that 
chat about what kind of illnesses. Yeah, so you know you don't want <laughs> you don't want somebody who's who's got the plague coming into the library. Um, oh, and there's your Google Chat thing is showing on the screen, um, right? So you you don't want that going on. Um, and we developed kits. So there's the privacy booths. There's the in in inside the library things. There's also um, like take home kits. So if you know, and they don't have to go home, but they can be used in the car um, or somewhere else where there's Wi-Fi. Or in some of them, we've included hotspots if it's a county. So we're, Colorado has all these mountains, so a lot of times. Uh, Hotspots don't work because you can't get a good cell signal, or sometimes there's one company that works and another company that doesn't. So there's many varieties of, of possibilities with the kits. We really let the local communities and local libraries decide what exactly went in the kit. But the take-home kit or the take-out of the library kit can be brought out um, and picked up uh, and then disinfected and brought back in the library. Um, and that's what a couple of the libraries are doing. So when we're talking about what are the people telehealthing about, it isn't always, you know, like, I think I have the plague today. Um, it, it can be follow-ups. Um, it can be bigger health issues that just need kind of monitoring, things like this. So that's, that's a lot of what the National Jewish, our other partner, is doing. And they've actually are really promoting this pro project with their rural patients. Um, and it's something that the director of National Jewish, or I think she was the director, is that right, Ashley? She's medical officer. Medical yeah. officer, okay. Um, she grew up r rurally and she was like, this is really important to me. Um, and so she's really pushing the idea that, yeah, you have to come in for your initial thing. And it is Denver and it's, it's a far drive. Um, but after that, we recommend telehealth and we can help you set that up. Um, yeah, medication management, that's another one. Um, so that really has helped us um, with with her helping us, really a good thing. And then there's the whole mental health thing. Wellpower, um, it's, they gave us in, uh, materials for their therapy direct program. Um, and that's been really good. Ashley can, I think, kind of tell you about that one maybe. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, one thing that Kieran and uh, Sharon and I talked about was just resources for these libraries that are implementing this. And again, health is, um, you know, maybe not the focus of a library, right? So what are the resources um, that folks can be connected to? Because some folks are going to come in and, and may not have a provider that they're already established with. And so mm -hmm. we did this kind of scan, and it's ongoing. Um, and I can show you the we can show you the ready reference uh, later. But we tried to reach out to partners that do provide telehealth services at a statewide level um, that we could hang posters in the booths or have those uh, flyers go out in the in the take home kits. So in case someone that does need to connect directly uh, with someone or they're not already established, they've got some resources to do that. So Wellpower is a community mental health center in the Denver area, uh, but they do have a therapy direct program that is available to folks anywhere in the state um, and it's it so we provided information on that and we had a couple other resources from um, other partners as well um, and then yeah just to the national Jewish piece the other having a champion in the medical space has been really great yeah. and again the, the project's still going and we're hoping to gather some more partners but um, you know just them connecting us to other folks in their in their um, team so uh, Carrie connected us over to the uh, their library folks within the uh, National Jewish Health, and they actually provided a webinar for the libraries in our program in terms of, hey, here's how to kind of, here's what we do, here's what we offer to patients, um, you know, and, and just to kind of ease folks' fears about, and give them kind of a heads up on, here's what you might experience throughout this, here's what a patient portal is, here are the questions that we typically get. So again, that was really helpful. And then just connecting us to the Colorado Hospital Association. Um, mm -hmm. we went, I went to a conference to try to um, you know, gather some more awareness about this program from there as well. Um, 
And I'll let Kieran talk about the local partnerships piece because um, that's really exciting. We've got some libraries that are reaching out to their local health providers. But before I do that, I'll just, I just want to say a huge thank you also to the state partners. Um, and I mean other states <laughs> that are doing this already. Uh, so Rachel from the Idaho Department of Health and uh, Welfare was, as she met with me several times, was super generous with a ton of the resources that uh, she used to build up their program in Idaho with the Commission for Libraries. Um, Alta from the Delaware Libraries met with us and shared resources, and then Diane from Pottsboro in Texas. So um, it was. this has been such a wonderful project and that everyone is really willing to share. We all just want to see, you know, these projects across the board be successful. And so um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to those folks for sharing their wisdom and as they're a bit ahead of us in, in, the, in terms of this project. Yeah, and local partnerships. So. One of our libraries, pilot libraries, was able to um, make a partnership with Health Solutions, which is um, a, a local health clinic chain uh, there in, in their area. Um, and it was interesting. They had a, uh, a launch event, so they the library had a big community celebration. Um, they had uh, tea and, and coffee and, and cookies and and uh, the press was there it was it was a big deal and the um, partners from from the from Pueblo uh, Health Solutions came and they were able to talk about you know like from their end because libraries aren't the telehealth providers they're the health providers we're providing access right we're providing access and we're providing um, basic literacy help. Literacy might be digital literacy help. So I think that knowing what it is that they do or what they're going to be doing with a patient was helpful, I think, both for the for the uh, patrons to see, oh, this is the part the librarian can help me with. This is the part the, you know, doctors or nurses are, are going to be doing on, on, online. And this is, you know, my medical stuff is over here in this bucket. Me being able to access it is is over here, and kind of um, also help the librarians. It's like, okay, what exactly is going to happen in the telehealth appointment? You know, like, what is it exactly that the patrons are going to need to know, other than like how to log into their portal, or you know, like that they have to write down their password or something. You know, like what is it? So I think that really helped all of us at that launch event kind of understand the difference there and, and see what it was that that telehealth could offer when i first heard about uh, another group that does telehealth dentistry i was like oh yeah because if i could get my fillings done over the internet that'd be awesome but i don't think that's how it works um so that was a really interesting conversation You're like what is it that telehealth is um, and I think that really helped me understand what it what it was I would, might be asking librarians to do. And I, I've been saying this from the beginning: um, no librarian wants to see a patron's mole. No librarian wants to have to touch anything that had to do with any sort of blood or bodily fluid. Like, no, absolutely not. Um, so you know, like when I think about te telehealth, you know, and, and like having somebody come into the library for that it might seem like mission creep sort of like that kind of idea that that you know we're, we're out of our lane and it really isn't um it's it re kind of reminded me back in the day when when libraries used to have public phones and that was like a big deal right and or or phone reference and it was what it's not about necessarily who's calling who on the phone it's about having that access and when computer like when internet started happening and we were you know it was before starbucks was everywhere and providing inter internet for everybody um before internet was ubiquitous and libraries were holding down that part and it's like yeah this is about access this is about access to something that really will help our communities so that's kind of my take on on that and the local partnership part I think really helps with that kind of community connection and understanding what what is going to be happening and you know like 
how it, how it will work in your library. Um, lessons learned, right? So, I guess one of the things I, I would like to to say about lessons learned is is what about HIPAA? I, I've I've had all sorts of questions about that, and and like what, how does it, how does you know how does a library fit in this in this bucket? And and you know like what if somebody sees somebody using the telehealth thing? Like is that breaking HIPAA? Like a lot of uh, un, unsure. The librarians are unsure about this, and and I think that's really why um, we wanted to talk about access. It's not healthcare, right? It's access to healthcare, um, and you can check out our uh, template acknowledgement form. It's also available on the on the website when you go click on the four libraries part. Um, you. you you, there, that's also where the media kit is and some some other things we have already referenced um but you, you will also see there the the template acknowledgement form and yes you should definitely use it as a template and not just print it out um yes you should customize it to to your world and and not to a, a general uh thing but the main thing i've figured out is it it's okay like you don't have to worry about the HIPAA thing so much. It's okay. We're providing access. We're not providing medical assistance. We're not uh, sharing medical records because we would have never had your medical records. There is some stuff about, yeah, you need to wipe somebody's, not only their fingerprints or germs from the computer, but their data or their logins or their passwords, just like all the other things that we do usually in libraries to perfect, prevent, uh, protect patron privacy. So that's kind of, yeah, the the long and short of that. Um, the other thing uh, that I would say was a lesson learned is is that marketing. Um, I think this is I think this is true of of many programs, especially in rural and small libraries, but I think it could be uh, for bigger libraries also. Um, it takes a while for things to catch on. And if you try something and it doesn't catch on in the first like three months, that doesn't mean anything. Um, that really taking taking it the, the long-term approach to this and, and being like, okay, you know, we're just gonna try this for a year or two and see how folks react and, and kind of keeping that consistency of this is available to you. And when you, decided you need it, it'll be here for you. Um, and some of the ways that we've talked about doing that, because it's hard to get the word out always, um, is we made a, a media toolkit. And it has our logos and some posters, some little cards that you can hand out, um, template kind of announcements and, and press releases for different, you know, like for your newsletter or for the press. And I think that kind of marketing um, is is an important part of our pilot project um, to to be able to again when you're talking to a library that has less than one f uh, full time staff you know having stuff that's ready to go having stuff that they can download and sort of just put their name on and and put out into the world makes a lot easier makes the whole process a lot smoother um, and really allows them to focus on the things they need to focus on and and not you know, publicizing another project for the state library. So, let's see. Uh, we also have all of that both in English and in Spanish on there. Um, and I, th I think, yeah, I think my main lesson learned is that things take time. Um, even the privacy booths themselves, the vendors, it's like, okay, here's your money, order your stuff. Oh, the vendor can't get you a privacy booth for six weeks. Okay, you know, like, that's cool. Huh, <sighs> you know, I guess you're not gonna roll it out next month. Okay, you know, like that, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think figuring out that things just take a lot longer than I, I thought they would. Yeah, and then I, I think, um... 
uh, also again, just having a lot of respect for the work that librarians do and that uh, these librarians were, or libraries were um, just, I guess, brave enough to just take this on. Again, even though they have maybe limited staff or limited, uh, you know, smaller operating budgets. Um, and so, you know, that while we would have loved to have a, a neat bow at the end of this fiscal year, which is July 1st, essentially, um, um, here's the evaluation, here's what we found, here's how many people are using it, and here's the impact on communities. Um, you know, that it, it was a slower process to, to get things purchased, to Kieran's point, to get things in. And so, um, Thankfully, we've built, uh, we've been working on this for only a, just over a year, actually, is when we met uh, to really put together, well, how do we put this project together? Uh, libraries just received their funding what last fall, and some of them even a little farther, a uh, little later than that. And so um, we've built this really strong partnership between OHI and the, and the Colorado State Library, and, and, and the libraries, Kieran uh, already had strong relationship with the libraries themselves. And so working together after the funding itself is maybe done, but how do we continue to kind of measure the impact, support libraries in continuing to, you know, fine tune this project or what or react to what resources they need, continue to try to build up partnerships. So we, we'll talk about that in the next steps. But that uh, is kind of what we're thinking and, you know, an, an acknowledgement to the time it takes to really roll uh, out a new project. Um, and so again, uh, just to reiterate, we're working on a community impact report. We're now going to push that to the winter, uh, hoping to have some good data by then, I'm sure, uh, and continue to grow partnerships. Um, Colorado has a variety of different programs happening in the health space. One is the hospital transformation uh, program, and that actually has um, several different hospitals that are in the regions of the libraries funded that are working on increasing their telemedicine utilization. Um, and so trying to build those partnerships and make connections between the libraries and the healthcare partners as well. Um, and then again, to continue to support the libraries with training and resources as they really get into this and see what, uh, what it's like and what the community needs to really be involved in the, or you know, to use these resources. And then based on the evaluation outcome, we'd love to grow the pilot. So bring on some other funding partners or, um, you know, expand this out. You know, we started with rural because I think that's near and dear to both of our hearts. But I, there's certainly opportunities to fund this in, in urban areas as well. Um, so really based on what we learned from the evaluation, fine tuning and, and then growing the project uh, from there. And right now, I think the where the project is is kind of uh, growing I want to say it's like a cohort so the pilot libraries are kind of sharing with each other the things that they're finding work you know what are you know what are how are you doing with the the box that you're putting the stuff in to hand out as a kit you know or are you use, you know like how are you packaging this how are you cleaning that how are you dealing with these other things and I think those kinds of things are the are the results of it being a pilot project and figuring out those kind of best practices or or like easiest ways to do things and and it's the libraries themselves that are figuring that out and and kind of sharing with each other how that's going and we're kind of note taking on that and making sure it gets on the website for everyone to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I just want to also offer some resources. And I know Megan, I saw put in the National Working Group, which is great. Um, but um, here are some other resources as well. Um, so there's uh, regional telehealth resource centers that are federally funded. Um, the Northwest has put together a telehealth map. So it started off in just kind of that region, but they've expanded it to be nationwide. So we were able to write in and say, you know, say here are libraries that have the telehealth hubs in them. Um, and so those can be kind of found, um, found through that map. And then they also developed a curriculum for navigating the telehealth neighborhood. Um, so that we so we've shared that with um, the libraries involved in this project. Um, and then again, the link to the website is there. All of the resources uh, Kieran talked about are on there. Um, and then just a suggestion to folks: if you're in here, I'm, I'm assuming this you're interested in this idea. And I would just say that um, if you're not already familiar with the, your own state's digital equity planning. 
funds that were that are just wrapping up and the capacity funds from the NCIA that are just that were just released uh, or the note the notice of funding opportunity was just released. It's a great way to kind of see what your state's planning around uh, digital access in general and where uh, certainly I'm hope hopefully they've already the folks running that have already reached out to you uh, the libraries but just something to kind of pay attention to there if you have if you're not familiar already. And that is actually the end of our presentation. I'm happy to kind of move into questions. Thank you so much, Ashley and Karen. Um, while people in attendance are formulating their questions, um, I do have a couple for you. So in the NNLM program, we do small seed funding uh, for projects. Um, but we also work with a lot of the same kinds of libraries that you're working with, Karen, you know, small uh, libraries, maybe that 0.62 FTE. Um, and one of the barriers that are is articulated to us is on the reporting end. Mm -hmm. Like we give them $5,000 and then there seems to be a ridiculous amount of reporting that they need to do for that money. So it makes it not worth their while. Um, what do you have reporting requirements for this pilot project and and how did you come about how much work that would be right you know that's something i hear a lot about as one of the main uh barriers to to any grant funding um absolutely um and we did a pre-survey and i believe i want to double check but I, I think it was four or five questions yeah just really mm -hmm. simple um so that was the pre, like before, before you get rolling with the, you know, because it's a pilot project. So we want to have where did it start, where did it end? Um, we have two sort of monthly things. One, one of the monthly things is um, the lib for the library uh, professional has to enter how many times it got checked out or or used or what have you. Um, and it's it's again, it's a monthly thing. We send a reminder. It's in the same reporting system that they do their annual report. So it's not a new thing or a different thing. It's that same thing. Um, and it's, again, I think it's two, two or three questions. Just really easy. Like how many? Just numbers. Um, and I th think there is a, a box if there was a special story. Um, but we also have another thing we want them to turn in every month, which is the patron use user surveys, right? So if you hand them the kit, you're also handing them a piece of paper or a QR code, because it can be done online. Um, I find that paper surveys get turned in more often than electronic surveys, but both are available um, and translated in English and Spanish um, or any other language that the library requests it to be in. Um, and that's, I think, the most onerous of them because I think there's like more questions but it's like why are you using it how you like what do you what are you thinking why did you come here and that's kind of to get to get our 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 impact to figure out how you know how is it that we are helping people um, and then at the end of the project after a, a year we're going to have a post survey so there's four surveys three that the library is responsible for the, li the library professional is responsible for and one that's more of the patron but the library has to turn it in. Um, so that post survey is the same as that pre survey. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Kathy. Do you have a picture of the booth? And um, if you don't, that's okay. I've got one that we can send a link to um, okay. when we do a follow up email for everybody. But I don't know if you have a picture of the booth uh, configuration that you're using. Mm -hmm not easily accessible <laughs> um all right unfortunately i'm sorry but they're kind of like i would call them like modern day phone booths and and i've seen them in libraries before as like workspaces or meeting rooms like that yeah and i can offer a little more context to just you know this was not a one-size-fits-all project we no. tried to be responsive with what does the library what will work for the library um, and how do we support that? So we have some libraries that are retrofitting an existing space, and that's something we actually heard from Pottsboro. So, you know, here, here's funding to outfit a uh, space that's already within your library that maybe you could just repurpose for this um, and equip with the right equipment. Um, and then some libraries, I think Talkbox was one of the brands. I think there was a couple other ones right here. And, but 
um, they had space within the library, but didn't have an existing infrastructure. So can put the, that in. Other libraries are uh, chose to do dividers. So they're kind of creating a um, they're like movable walls essentially. So they can create that space, but it's not permanently there. Um, so there's there's pros and cons to all of these, but we really did let the we wanted the library to kind of lead in what was the best fit for their space and their community, rather than saying everybody gets a twenty thousand dollar talk box <laughs> and you know uh, we're talking about rural and small libraries so space is a thing right not everybody has room for one of those privacy pods but you know it's like oh well you know if somebody's making an appointment i can put this uh curtain over this little you know thing that used to be a closet and now we call our meeting room you know like everybody has a different place or space that they have seemed to have created um, and some of it, we've said, okay, yeah, you know, like a, maybe a white noise machine or something, you know, so you, it's not so, you know, overhearable. <laughs> but, you know, other than that, it's, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. All right. Maureen asks, um, you mentioned low utilization among those over 60. Have you partnered with any organizations working with that population? Yeah, so this is, it's a little bit outside of this project particularly, because this is just kind of, those are those stats for the state, um, but our, the OHI um, is looking at really some more community-focused work. So in the past, we have tried to, and we, we continue to do this, but support providers in offering their service, and also, a, a, to be fair, healthcare had to really go through a big transformation pretty quickly in the last few years. But we are starting to look more locally. So what does this look like in a particular region of the state, and are there some concerns around quality that are also playing into it. So is it not just maybe an infrastructure and access device issue, but is there also some concerns around, again, quality or trust or wanting to see your healthcare provider? And so we're going through, um, actually we're working with an organization right now to survey um, four county, rural counties in the state to get some more granular information there and to potentially looking at public service announcements and then working with local partnerships, so maybe that's the Area Agency on Aging for that zone, um, local healthcare providers to try to disseminate information on telehealth and really what it is, because I think, in my mind, I think sometimes we take it, uh, we we make assumptions about what people know and, and, and you know, so anyway, trying to kind of approach it from that perspective and more community grounded lens. So um, through the digital access and the digital equity and inclusion work that's happening at the state, absolutely, we're working with AARP and Senior Planet and some of the, uh, a lot of more local organizations working with seniors across the state. Uh, but for this project particularly, we have not engaged any of those community partners at this point. All right, we have a question from Ling Ling. Do health systems or government agencies often initiate projects like this with libraries? She was trying to think of states um, that don't have these initiatives, and so how would you go about uh, creating that kind of collaboration? Yeah, well, I'd say that um, it, it, I think it's very, it has been very different. I mean, I named those state partners. They all came about these projects very, very differently. I think Rebecca pointed out that one's funded by NNLM. Um, Idaho, it actually is coming from kind of their Department of Health and, and Welfare. Um, and then the Delaware project, I think that was very Delaware led and they had so or Delaware library level led. Um, so I think if if it were me starting off in a state, the public health department sometimes has funding that supports this and they are usually you know pretty focused on equity and access to you know, sometimes it might be specific to chronic diseases and, you know, or supports to help folks with chronic diseases or prevent them. Um, but that would be a place that I would start. I think what can be really challenging is that the funding structure uh, is can be really limiting. Um, a lot of the state health departments, for example, they are very federal, like they're federally funded through their own grants. And so there's a lot of, you know, stipulations with what they're able to use those funds for. In our instance, um, we're actually able to fund this with state dollars, and that has been a, a, a we've been very lucky to have that um, because there are less that we're able to be a little bit more creative with how we're able to to use those funds and be more community grounded in what that looks like. We don't have a mandate saying, well, we have to spend this funding on this particular issue in this particular way, which is unfortunately sometimes what happens um, or how that's kind of structured. All right, well, we've got time for one more question, and I'm going to um, hit on Erin from Minnesota. Welcome. 
Um, they are working on a project to provide statewide access to um, a library of clinical health information resources. And uh, since this is right up my alley and NNLM's alley of health information, um, were, as a part of this project, was there any sort of talk about including health information or how a library might promote the access that they have to health information if, if a patron coming in had then questions that came out of this medical appointment that they had? Yeah. Um, I we're pushing databases with that one. Um, it's definitely a, a question and, and and something that, you know, especially again in smaller and rural, more rural libraries, the collection of medical books may not be as extensive as, as a, a bigger library. Um, and having those kind of online ready reference, we. I was telling Ashley about the concept of ready reference the other, the other day and, and just like, because it's kind of old school library, right? Like we used to have the ready reference shelf and now it's usually more like ready reference list of links. Um, but having those and, and having databases available and, and having that kind of, again, it's a typical library interaction on, on, a, on, on a reference question and being able to provide that information. I think that's really important. So we had talked with the Department of Public Health and Environment to see, well, our funding, you know, we we did set out some restrictions on, okay, we, we're going to purchase equipment, and in order to be able to do advanced payments, we had to structure things a certain way. Yeah. We're trying to look for, and I think hopefully this is getting answering this from a different lens, is what other uh, uh, funding sources exist that could support libraries in refreshing some of the information that they have, or like, you know, uh, making sure that the diet, book on diabetes diet is up to date, not from maybe, you know, 1980 or something like that. Um, so we weren't able to fund that with this pot, but but Kieran, I mean, really helped me see like, oh, this is actually an issue that libraries have and having to figure out how to fund that refresh, so. Um, and I don't know if this is an easily answerable question, but we do have two more minutes left, so. Um, Michaela asks, are there any necessary applications re required to be installed on the computers um, to be able to utilize the telehealth services since all these different healthcare providers use different platforms? So basically it's just a, a web link they're going to, right? Like, like I was apps. worried about that, you know, because like I know for my medical stuff, I have my chart and it's an app and I downloaded it and it has my information built in. And I was like, oh, how is this going to work at a library? Um, and, and and we were lucky again, um, the librarians from, from National Jewish Medical Library were able to help us understand that, yeah, okay, that's a way you could do it. And, and you could help a patron with their app on their phone, or you can have them open the browser version <laughs> right and it was like oh okay there's a browser version you know like those kind of things so there, there hasn't been a lot of specialty things that we're aware of at this point um, at all and nothing that can't be you know e either like with some sort of deep freeze or uh, a browser set a certain way where it wipes your info when the you log out um, nothing like that has been a problem great well Ashley and Kieran, thank you so much. Uh, this project is so exciting for me, one, because I live in Colorado, but I think just as a, um, a pilot project for anywhere in the country or the world, I just think it's a great project. Um, so thank you both for being here. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.